Um, so an introduction for Mark. Um, he is a native of Portland in the Gresham area, um, and he has a strong dedication to preserving our past. He created HistoryPDX.com in 1998 and has been the president and editor of Webfooter since 2005. Um, and most recently this year, he became caretaker at the Oregon Electric Railway Museum. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and see him a warm welcome. Thank you, Mary. Well, I really enjoyed David's talk today, and I uh, want to say that I really learned some things. Uh, I know what it takes to research for uh, presentations, and uh, uh, it was very helpful, and uh, uh, brought back uh, some memories of uh, my childhood, and uh, uh, today, as Mary mentioned, we are taking kind of a different look at historic preservation and focusing on uh, photos, postcards, and antique paper or ephemera. And uh, ephemera uh, was created uh, or printed for the here and now, and then it was discarded tomorrow. So it was here today, gone tomorrow. So if you find examples of antique paper from 100 or 140 years ago, they are rare and hard to find. And one of the things that helped um, with uh, the popularity and explosion of, po of postcards was the invention of photography. And that happened in the mid-1800s, the development. Um, and uh, it spawned things like uh, stereo-optic view cards. I've got a little bit of show and tell today. Uh, this happens to be uh, a photo of uh, uh, north of Lenneman Junction and uh, by Ruby Junction. So uh, I lived uh, right at Ruby Junction for 11 years, so um, finding this piece was very significant for me. And uh, you had to have a um, uh, stereo optic viewer to properly see uh, these. And uh, there, as you can tell, there are two images and they would be combined into one, and that's why it was called a stereo-optic uh, viewer. And uh, so we'll be uh, taking a look at, at uh, uh, some of the things that are on postcards. Uh, it allowed people to see uh, photos of their family or friends, uh, where they lived, where they worked, and where they visited throughout the world. And uh, due to the popularity of photos and postcards, history would be forever immortalized in print. And postcards became a standard size medium uh, for communication, for advertising, and promotion. Uh, most postcards, uh, at least uh, up until, say, the 1980s and before and after, were a three and a half by five and a half inch uh, format. Uh, today they're called um, uh, continental size. They're just a little larger, but uh, uh, they became the calling card for cities, towns, and businesses, and roadside attractions. Mm -hmm. And souvenir shops sprang up all over the country, and they sold postcards that would extol the values of their particular corner of the world. And uh, Mary invited me here today as a representative of the Webfooters Postcard Club, and uh, uh, my motto is, it's all about history, 
and preserving history is the key to our future. History can tell us a story if we let images speak. And today, our goal is to document and create a historical record of times past by sharing something inanimate with you and bringing it to life. So the Web Footers Postcard Club um, started in 1966, and uh, Mary specifically wanted me to share with you a little bit about it. Um, I joined the club in 1984, and uh, our members have so many different interests that our official motto is, every subject known to man can be found on a postcard. So I have um, uh, material over here on this table. Feel free to take that with you. You'll find out more about the postcard club and some of the other activities that I'm involved in. Um, when I was uh, a technical writer at US Bank in 1984, uh, I answered an ad in our uh, internal weekly publication and there was a fellow with the postcard club named Al Powers who worked in the coin vault and uh, uh, that was my first introduction to the web footers um, and we currently have about 200 members who meet monthly and we share uh, and exchange our collections photos, postcards, and antique paper. And uh, just to give you a little bit of history about me, um, I uh, bring up a little background information because I'm proud of the fact that I grew up in Gresham and uh, really enjoyed seeing photos that David uh, had of uh, uh, the Carnegie Library, um, my mom would drop me off there, and that was my babysitter. So. <laughs> um, and uh, I was about a year old when we moved to Gresham. Uh, my parents had day jobs, but nights and weekends we had a 30-acre farm, and we raised filberts. They were not known as hazelnuts at that time. <laughs> And uh, we also had berries, so every day we would take our berries to the Gresham Berry Growers. And uh, uh, in 2005, uh, I became president and editor of the Web Footers. And um, uh, just recently, as she mentioned, became a caretaker at the Oregon Electric Railway Museum, uh, a company that I worked at for nearly 20 years was uh, sold this summer in August, and my job was eliminated. I guess they preferred to hire part-time people and utilize electronic security. So no more need for a uh, security person on guard all night long. But it's nice not to get bothered every day at 4.30 in the morning. Wow. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, uh, I became the caretaker for the Oregon Electric Railway Museum in Brooks, Oregon. And this is at Antique Powerland. Um, people always like to see uh, where I live, and I'm upstairs above a trolley depot. <laughs> and uh, during uh, the summer months, uh, uh, May through uh, Labor Day, you can ride a trolley at uh, uh, our museum. So uh, uh, I want to tie uh, this historic preservation with a bit of history of Gresham and give a timeline of sorts. Um, most of you know that Gresham was settled in the mid-1800s. 
uh, by pioneer settlers named Powell from the Midwest, and the area became known as Powell's Valley. And then by the 1870s, there was a religious camp meeting ground that was established here, and this became a popular stop-off point for people traveling to Portland. And so the first post office was established here on July 12, 1871. It was called Campground. And then uh, a local merchant decided that um, there needed to be a, a better name and location for the post office. Uh, so he petitioned uh, for a new post office in his store and suggested that it be named after the Postmaster General at the time, uh, Walter Quinton Gresham, who was a former colonel in the Union Army. So they approved his request. A new post office called Gresham was established here on May 15, 1884. And the campground post office subsequently closed on June 9th uh, that same year. And when we start researching the history of an area, we find that the post office kept really good records. And so that's kind of the starting point for finding out when a community was established. And um, uh, David mentioned several other ways that you could find out information. Um, in the days before the internet, um, there were always newspaper articles, and fortunately a lot of old newspapers have been uh, uh, photographed and put on microfilm and digitized, um, and also uh, deeds. Uh, records with the city or county. Um, so those are ways that you can, can do some of your research. And um, uh, some of the earliest postcards, or I'm sorry, photographs, uh, date back to the mid-1880s. Now I'm talking local photographs. It's very hard to find anything before that. But even the 1880s, um, trust me, they're, they're very hard to find. Um, and so um, uh, I'll mention here that trade cards uh, kind of filled the gap starting in the uh, 1870s. And then they were followed by the stereo optic views and then Postal cards were developed in the 1890s, and then postcards as we know them uh, followed in 1898 to 1901. And a couple of significant things that helped make Gresham grow and uh, kind of got us on the map uh, allowed uh, for uh, uh, the use of postcards. Uh, Interurban streetcar service from Portland to Gresham was inaugurated in 1903, and then two years later, Gresham was incorporated as a city. So I mentioned trade cards. Um, I do not have any from Gresham, but these are examples of uh, local uh, trade cards from the 1880s for Portland the front and the back. <clears throat> and then uh, souvenir postal cards uh, came on the scene in uh, May of 19 or of 1893. And uh, there were beautiful uh, scenes from the fair that uh, were printed on government po uh, printed postal cards and on privately printed souvenir cards. Now the back side uh, was reserved for the address only. And I'll show you what the back of this looks like. 
and it is actually three and a half by five and a half, but for this illustration, I kind of cut off the extra at the bottom. So, um, as you can see, it's inscribed for the address only. And then, uh, uh, if we go ahead here, this is a souvenir postal card, and this was uh, authorized in 1898. And uh, as you can see, uh, these were um, made with uh, a picture of Mount Hood um, engraved on the back. And I'll point out that stamp box over on the right. Those are very important when it comes to dating uh, postcards. And uh, in 1901, uh, Congress authorized uh, the use of an undivided back postcard, uh, and they pretty much replaced the private mailing cards that I showed previously. And again, this is for the address only, and they have taken off the inscription that it's authorized by an act of Congress. So, um, again, you'll see a stamp box, they vary in uh, shape and uh, uh, what, they, uh, what they represent. Now here is the next development. It came along in 1907, the divided back postcard. And this time uh, you can put a note here and the name and address on the right. Previous to this time, all of your correspondence had to be on the front side. So you either had to write over the picture, or sometimes there was a, a, a section to the side of the picture or below the picture where you could write your message. Okay, now we get into uh, photos. Um, and uh, uh, this is an actual uh, black and white photograph, and then and, and circa from 1885, and I kind of like to. Uh, mess with photos just a little, I guess you could say. Uh, I always like to make them into a sepia tone. Uh, it seems to bring things out a little more and make it a little more interesting. Adds a little bit of color and interest. And... Uh, Is this the earliest one? Uh, it, yeah, it's a Gresham. And... Uh, go on here and this is a photo uh, circa 1904 we mentioned the uh, interurban that went uh, from Portland to Gresham and it went on out to uh, Estacada and Casadero and uh, let's see. you'll notice this building with the pitch roof that was the depot uh, in Gresham at the time. And uh, this was a uh, uh, streetcar with a trolley pole, and it was uh, uh, connected to the, the overhead wire, and that's provided the electricity for that car to run. And the car in the back was considered a trailer. It was not electrified, it had no motors. <clears throat> What's that running along? Is that that is know? the, the uh, Springwater line, better known today as the Springwater Trail. The uh, rails were taken out in uh, the 1990s, I believe. And um, 
So prior to that time, that was a uh, uh, freight line up until the 90s, went out to Boring. Now the portion beyond Boring out to Estacada uh, was uh, uh, abandoned in, I believe, 1932. And over uh, the next 10 years or so, a lot of the rail that was out there uh, was salvaged and used in the holes of the ships that were built in Portland in the shipyards. Okay, now we're getting to some postcards and uh, you'll see the, the band here. They were uh, welcoming the crowd on the train. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things about this photo was that the person that I acquired it from did not know where that was. And so when I saw this building and the hill behind, I knew instantly that that was the Gresham Depot. So um, I give this uh, a circa 1909 as a date. And a lot of times, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the back uh, helps you date uh, the origin of the, uh, the time that it was taken. That is the back, and as you can see, it has the uh, uh, divided uh, back. And uh, this happens to be a V-Lox uh, stamp box. And just to give you an idea uh, how we date some of these things, uh, there are sites online that have pictures of the varying stamp boxes. And you can refer to these, and they give you uh, the time that those stamp boxes were produced. Now, not always are these uh, postmarked or postally used. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we call unused, and so there's no clue as to when this was put into circulation. So uh, that's why I give it a circa 1909. Okay, here is a postcard of an uh, early view of Gresham, and my belief is that this writing kind of dates that card because it's very similar to a photographer that uh, uh, photographed uh, the Springwater line uh, out to Casadero, and the writing seems to match uh, the, the actual uh, uh, letters uh, are very similar to uh, other photographs that he took. I wish I knew the name of the photographer, but again, that's something that gets lost to history because no one ever really recorded a lot of that stuff. And I believe this is a school. Uh, from uh, comparing that to other photographs of, of schools in Gresham, um, that's, that's my best guess. That school probably would be West Gresham, and where it was written, Gresham, Oregon, it looked like it was on the... Um, it would have been an earlier version of, of what we know today as West Gresham. Yeah, from the back. It looked like where they wrote Gresham, Oregon was right on the cemetery. Okay. Yeah, it's all the tombstones. Is that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that is one good thing about blowing these up to a large size, it helps you to see things that you otherwise might not see. So uh, this was a uh, uh, 
hotel in Gresham, and um, you'll see that in several of the uh, early photos. Here's the same building, and um, this could be 1908, 1910, 1911. You can see it's been colorized. Um, a lot of the uh, postcards uh, started as a photograph and then through the process of lithography, and most of that was done in Germany because they had developed uh, some really high standards for uh, uh, printing and lithography, and so they would throw in the color because obviously uh, photographs at this time were all black and white. So here is another example of that similar writing that I mentioned. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, putting it in the 1905-1906 era. If I was an expert in old cars, you know, maybe I could, could identify that car. And this is uh, another bird's eye view of Gresham. I learned from David's presentation. Uh, I assume this to be about 1908, looking at their uh, clothing styles, but uh, he said that this was not built until 1911. So. <laughs> okay, here is a uh, view of Bain and Powell. 1910, and here we have a back that has a postmark, and uh, as you can see, 1910 is real clear there, and the fact that this was printed in Germany uh, is put right on the back of the card there. Um, they didn't identify the publisher or photographer or anything like that, but um, uh, those postmarks can be very helpful in determining when a postcard was produced. Powell looking west. And this is another view of Powell. Um, and this time, this view is colorized, and there is the back. And a couple of things are visible here. You have a date of August 1609 there, and it's a little faint, but you also have a 1909 date there. Helpful for research. Uh, this postcard actually uh, identifies the year, and uh, this was uh, uh, done for the Grange Fair Association for 1911, and uh, a really nice view of the uh, grandstands at the uh, horse track. Here is uh, a uh, photo of the Red Cross Dairy Wagon in Gresham, circa 1912. Uh, I know it's a little hard to see, but there's the Red Cross Dairy. And uh, so 
some of you are familiar with the Latterell family. Uh, they were Ford agents in Gresham. And again, if I was an expert on automobiles, I could date that by those cars. Uh, I am involved with the uh, Northwest Vintage Car and Motorcycle Museum down at uh, Antique Powerland. And they look similar to cars of that age. So that's why I dated that um, at that point. They looked like T's and they were built for quite a while. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this uh, view is one of my favorites. Um, and you'll notice the WA over here. That was the photographer's initials, Wesley Andrews. He traveled throughout the West, um, mostly um, Portland, um, the coast and the Columbia River Gorge. And uh, uh, much of this work was, say, 1932, 1933. And some of those buildings you can still see here in Gresham. Um, as David mentioned, Gresham is very fortunate to have preserved a lot of the historic buildings that are still here. Uh, unlike a lot of uh, our sister neighboring cities. Here's another Wesley Andrews view. Just a little before my time. But I do remember the Multnomah County Fairgrounds and the entrance having grown up here in the 50s and 60s. Where was that? Um, over uh, where Gresham Town Fair mm -hmm. is. Right. Right where East Hill East Church Park is. Park. East Hill Church. East Hill right. Church is built right where that, that entrance is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we uh, move up into the 40s, um, and this was uh, the North Gresham Depot. Uh, the other depot that we saw was considered the South Depot, and after the Estacada line went out, um, they mostly used the South Depot for freight. And so uh, another line was built from Portland, uh, from 90th and Gleason out to Bull Run. And it stopped here at Gresham. And uh, I remember when we would bring our uh, berries uh, to Gresham Berry Growers, it was just the uh, other side of the tracks over here. And then a lot of the berries would be shipped out on the train. And uh, this is when they still had passenger service um, out to Gresham. Uh, it didn't uh, go as far as Bull Run. A lot of that was uh, uh, torn up uh, in the late 30s and early 40s for the, the ships, the holes. And so, um, service was discontinued about 1932 or 1933 on this line, except out to Gresham. Um, and I remember when, when I was real young, uh, we lived on Anderson Road, uh, which was just east of Gresham. Uh, didn't seem to get too much of the east wind at that point in time. <laughs> But uh, that was on the line for the, uh, the, the line that went to Boring. Uh, that line ended in Boring, and uh, it, it was there until the 90s. So, but uh, again, freight was, uh, was the uh, usage uh, after this time uh, at both of these depots. 
And here is the South Depot. Um, and they would go out as far as uh, Boring again. And when did that line stop running? Uh, in the 90s, as far as freight. Mm -hmm. Now, passenger service. Sure it didn't sell before that. Um, the line was still there. It's for, there, but it, I don't. I think it yeah, stopped running in the they just had, 70s, maybe. They maybe. just had some freight because of the lumber mills in Boring, and I remember there were um, rail fan groups that were there in the 90s, just before they took it out. They only had like one or two trains a week or something. Right. Like that. It was yeah, very very few trains. Mm -hmm. But, but passenger service um, was gone in the 40s. Mm -hmm. We lived you know where the max line is now that, that goes by to the um, Cleveland station and in there. We had freight trains on that track in the 70s. <clears throat> My bus route crossed that rail, rail track, and I don't recall any trains ever. There was a mink farm at the base of it, on um, Telford, and I don't recall trains beyond. I do remember in the um, 60s. Yeah, but I think yeah. it got abandoned in the 70s. I mean, I think it was for, there for, for a long yeah. time, but I don't think it got used beyond the 70s. There's another view of the South Depot. Now this is more what I remember from uh, my years growing up in Gresham. Um, Walrad Insurance, First National Bank. And my favorite store, the Cornette. <laughs> And if, if you'll notice here, it says Safeway. Um, but as I remember in the 60s, 50s, 60s, that was W.R. Hicks clothing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the power lines being held up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing what they did in those days. Wouldn't pass inspection. So um, it's been my privilege to, uh, to share with you some examples of history that I've acquired over the years. And I just want to cover just some real basic uh, things about handling uh, postcards. Um, I try to keep them in plastic sleeves. These are called acid-free. Uh, you, you do have to pay attention to, to finding ones that say that they are actually acid-free uh, to protect the cards. And then if it's a really good card like this one, uh, I'll put it in a hard sleeve. And again, uh, always look for acid-free. Uh, used to be able to get those at baseball card shops. Um, there's a uh, uh, bookstore uh, on Inner Division that still carries these. And then um, occasionally some of the stars, antique malls, will, will have these. And then you can also pick them up at uh, Expo. There are dealers there. And then I will put postcards <coughs> in these uh, uh, pocket pages. They come one pocket, two pocket, three pocket, four pocket. This happens to be a two pocket and it works pretty good for the uh, uh, stereo opticans. And uh, if you're handling negatives especially, you want to use some cotton gloves so that your uh, oils and uh, harmful dirt that could be on our hands um, don't get on the postcards and uh, destroy them. 
Um, and if you have negatives, uh, the best temperature to keep them at is about 40 degrees. Now, a friend of mine that's a photographer said that his best uh, experience was with frigid air uh, freezers or refrigerators because of the uh, uh, humidity was just about right with those. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, if, if you have uh, uh, a postcard like this, you probably don't want to keep it in an area that's like over 75 degrees. Uh, they, uh, they begin to uh, get too warm and can deteriorate. So, um, but uh, uh, if you uh, have any questions, I'd be very happy to, uh, to answer anything that I can. From a collector perspective, is a, is a postcard more valuable if it's unwritten on and unmarked or opposite? Um, it depends on condition more than usage either used or unused. Um, if it's a used card, um, it, uh, it can have um, a date, uh, but like with this card, it was in an album, and you'll see the residue from the glue and from the black paper. Uh, and neither of those things detract from the value. Um, they really don't because it's a it's a rare image. Um, so something like this, um, I I I don't remember what I paid for it, but I would think it would be in the seventy-five dollar category, <coughs> or between fifty and seventy-five. But um, uh, yeah, whether they're used or not used. Um, really does not affect uh, their value. Uh, as long as the condition is there, uh, that's 98% that's of their value. Mary? For the used cards, how often does what's written on it actually add to the story on the front of it? How much more history do you get out of when, what's written on them? That can come in real handy. Um, I do have some uh, examples on the back table. Uh, the first of, of Gresham, and then secondly, uh, uh, an album of photographer-related or postcard um, publisher-related information. And uh, one of the interesting things about a lot of the material in that album uh, they came out of an estate in Boring, and uh, this family had been photographers that traveled all over the Northwest and into California. And uh, uh, it's really interesting to read the messages because there will be, be personal information about the family. So that type of thing is, is really uh, a gem if you can find it. Um, I know there's uh, another uh, photographer that was uh, active in uh, Portland. He had a, uh, uh, I, I won't say they were related, but uh, a friend who uh, had the same last name and um, when when, and they had a, a studio in Oregon City, and they would converse back and forth with her parents. Now, she grew up in Gresham, and so as they traveled around the country, they would send these postcards back and forth, and they'd have images of the, the members of the family. And so, uh, it's very interesting to follow their stories. So there's there's a lot to what you can find on the back. Sometimes it's difficult to read. 
but uh, it's a lot of fun if you can find it. Does that lessen the value when they're like, because uh, my aunt around the turn of the century uh, was a school teacher in East Oregon, and when she went to school, there seems to be uh, postcards that have pictures of herself and her friends out, you know, going different places. I think it's great when you can find those. It, it, I mean, it, it, it tells a story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because you can identify who these people are. I mean, 95, 99% of the time, there is no information on the back. You haven't got a clue who you're looking at. And when you find the information that, it, that identifies the, the people that are on the, in the photo, uh, I think it adds to the value and the collectability. Oh, I wish I'd ask her. <laughs> 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 yeah, if they're still in your family, they're definitely worth um, pursuing and uh, researching. Yeah, I can try. Okay. So she's long gone. <laughs> so, I guess that's it. <laughs>